Section 25 of The Valley of the Moon by Jack London This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 2, Chapter 10 Billy could never get over the shock during that period of Saxon's appearance. Morning after morning and evening after evening, when he came home from work, he would enter the room where she lay and fight a royal battle to hide his feelings and make a show of cheerfulness and geniality. She looked so small lying there, so small and shrunken and weary, and yet so childlike in her smallness. Tenderly, as he sat beside her, he would take up her pale hand and stroke the slim, transparent arm, marveling at the smallness and delicacy of the bones. One of her first questions, puzzling alike to Billy and Mary, was, did they save little Emil Olson? And when she told them how he had attacked single-handed the whole twenty-four fighting men, Billy's face glowed with appreciation. The little cuss, he said, that's the kind of a kid to be proud of. He halted awkwardly, and his very evident fear that he had hurt her touched Saxon. She put her hand out to his. Billy, she began, then waited till Mary left the room. I've never asked before, not that it matters now, but I've waited for you to tell me. Was it? He shook his head. No, it was a girl, a perfect little girl, only it was too soon. She pressed his hand, and almost it was that she sympathized with him in his affliction. I never told you, Billy, you were so set on a boy, but I planned just the same, if it was a girl, to call her Daisy. You remember? That was my mother's name. He nodded his approbation. Say, Saxon, you know I did want a boy, like the very Dickens. Well, I don't care now. I think I'm just set as hard on a girl, and, well, here's hoping the next will be called. You wouldn't mind, would you? What? If we called it the same name, Daisy? Oh, Billy, I was thinking the very same thing. Then his face grew stern as he went on. Only there ain't going to be a next. I didn't know what having children was like before. You can't run any more risks like that. Here, the big, strong, afraid man talk, she jeered with a wan smile. You don't know anything about it. How can a man? I am a healthy, natural woman. Everything would have been all right this time if, if all that fighting hadn't happened. Where did they bury Bert? You knew? All the time. And where's Mercedes? She hasn't been in for two days. Old Barry's sick. She's with him. He did not tell her that the old night watchman was dying, two thin walls and a half a dozen feet away. Saxon's lips were trembling and she began to cry weakly, clinging to Billy's hand with both of hers. I, I can't help it, she sobbed. I'll be all right in a minute. Our little girl, Billy, think of it. And I never saw her. She was still lying on her bed when, one evening, Mary saw fit to break out in bitter thanksgiving that she had escaped, and was destined to escape what Saxon had gone through. Ah, oh, what are you talking about, Billy demanded. You'll get married sometime again, as sure as beans is beans. Not to the best man living, she proclaimed. And there ain't no call for it. There's too many people in the world now. Else, why are there two or three men for every job? And besides, having children is too terrible. Saxon, with a look of patient wisdom in her face that became glorified as she spoke, made answer. I ought to know what it means. I've been through it, and I'm still in the thick of it, and I want to say to you right now, out of all the pain and the ache and the sorrow, that it is the most beautiful, wonderful thing in the world. As Saxon's strength came back to her, and when Dr. Hentley had privily assured Billy that she was sound as a dollar, she herself took up the matter of the industrial tragedy that had taken place before her door. The militia had been called out immediately, Billy informed her, and was camped then at the foot of Pine Street on the waste ground next to the railroad yards. 
As for the strikers, fifteen of them were in jail. A house-to-house -house search had been made in the neighborhood by the police, and in this way nearly the whole fifteen, all wounded, had been captured. It would go hard with them, Billy foreboded gloomily. The newspapers were demanding blood for blood, and all the ministers in Oakland had preached fierce sermons against the strikers. The railroad had filled every place, and it was well known that the striking shopmen not only would never get their old jobs back, but were blacklisted in every railroad in the United States. Already they were beginning to scatter. A number had gone to Panama, and four were talking of going to Ecuador to work in the shops of the railroad that ran over the Andes to Quito. With anxiety keenly concealed, she tried to feel out Billy's opinion on what had happened. That shows what Bert's violent methods come to, she said. He shook his head slowly and gravely. They'll hang Chester Johnson anyway, he answered indirectly. You know him. You told me you used to dance with him. He was caught red-handed, lying on the body of a scab he beat to death. Old Jelly Belly's got three bullet holes in him, but he ain't going to die, and he's got Chester's number. They'll hang him on Jelly Belly's evidence. It was all in the papers. Jelly Belly shot him, too, a hanging by the neck on our pickets. Saxon shuddered. Jelly Belly must be the man with the bald spot and the tobacco-stained whiskers. Yes, she said, I saw it all. It seemed he must have hung there for hours. It was all over from first to last in five minutes. It seemed ages and ages. I guess that's the way it seemed to Jelly Belly. Stuck on those pickets, Billy smiled grimly. But he's a hard one to kill. He's been shot and cut up a dozen different times. But they say now he'll be crippled for life have to go around on crutches or in a wheelchair. That'll stop him from doing any more dirty work for the railroad. He was one of their top gun fighters, always up to his ears in the thick of any fighting that was going on. He never was leery of anything on two feet. I'll say that much for him. Where does he live? Saxon inquired. Up on Adeline, near Tenth. Fine neighborhood and fine two-storied house. He must pay thirty dollars a month rent. I guess the railroad paid him pretty well. Then he must be married. Yup. I never seen his wife, but he's got one son, Jack, a passenger engineer. I used to know him. He was a nifty boxer, though he never went into the ring. And he's got another son that's a teacher in the high school. His name's Paul. We're about the same age. He was great at baseball. I knew him when we was kids. He pitched me out three times hand running once when the Durant played the Cole School. Saxon sat back in the Morris chair, resting and thinking. The problem was growing more complicated than ever. This elderly, round bellied, and bald headed gunfighter, too, had a wife and family. And there was Frank Davis, married barely a year, with a baby boy. Perhaps the scab he shot in the stomach had a wife and children. All seemed to be acquainted, members of a very large family, and yet, because of their particular families, they battered and killed each other. She had seen Chester Johnson kill a scab, and now they were going to hang Chester Johnson, who had married Kitty Brady out of the cannery, and she and Kitty Brady had worked together years before in the paper box factory. Vainly, Saxon waited for Billy to say something that would show he did not countenance the killing of the scabs. It was wrong, she ventured finally. They killed Bert, he countered. And a lot of others. And Frank Davis, did you know he was dead? Had his whole lower jaw shot away. Died in the ambulance before they could get him to the receiving hospital. There was never so much killing at one time in Oakland before. But it was their fault, she contended. They began it. It was murder. Billy did not reply. She heard him mutter hoarsely. She knew, he said, God damn them. But when she asked what, he made no answer. 
His eyes were deep with troubled clouds, while the mouth had hardened and all his face was bleak. To her it was a heart stab. Was he too like the rest? Would he kill other men who had families like Bert and Frank Davis and Chester Johnson had killed? Was he too a wild beast, a dog that was snarl over a bone? She sighed. Life was a strange puzzle. Perhaps Mercedes Higgins was right in her cruel statement of the terms of existence. What of it? Billy laughed harshly, as if in answer to her unuttered question. It's dog eat dog, I guess, and it's always been that way. Take that scrap outside. They killed each other, just like the North and the South did in the Civil War. But working man can't win that way, Billy. You say yourself that it spoiled their chance of winning. I suppose not, he admitted reluctantly. But what other chance they've got to win, I don't see. Look at us. We'll be up against it next. Not the Teamster, she cried. He nodded gloomily. The bosses are cutting loose all along the line for a high old time. Say they're going to beat us to our knees till we come crawling back and begging for our jobs. They've bucked up real high and mighty. What of all the killing the other day? Having the troops out is half the fight, along with having the preachers and the papers and the public behind them. They're shooting off their mouths already about what they're going to do. They're sure gunning for trouble. First they're going to hang Chester Johnson and as many more of the fifteen as they can. They say that flat. The Tribune and the Enquirer and the Times keep saying it over and over every day. They're all union busting to beat the band. No more closed shop. To hell with organized labor. Why, the dirty little intelligencer came out this morning and said that every union official in Oakland ought to be run out of town or stretched up. Fine, huh? You bet it's fine. Look at us. It ain't a case any more of a sympathetic strike for the mill workers. We've got our own troubles. They fired our four best men the ones that was always on the conference committees, did it without cause. They're looking for trouble, as I told you, and they'll get it, too, if they don't watch out. We got our tip from the Frisco Waterfront Confederation. With them backing us, we'll go some. You mean you'll strike? Saxon asked. He bent his head. But isn't that what they want you to do, from the way they're acting? What's the difference? Billy shrugged his shoulders, then continued, It's better to strike than to get fired. We beat them to it, that's all, and we catch them before they're ready. Don't we know what they're doing? They're collecting grading camp drivers and mule skinners all up and down the state. They've got forty of them, feeding them in a hotel in Stockton right now, and ready to rush them in on us, and hundreds more like them. So this Saturday's the last wages I'll likely bring home for some time. Saxon closed her eyes and thought quietly for five minutes. It was not her way to take things excitedly. The coolness of poise that Billy so admired never deserted her in time of emergency. She realized that she herself was no more than a moat caught up in this tangled, non-understandable conflict of many moats. We'll have to draw from our savings to pay for this month's rent, she said brightly. Billy's face fell. We ain't got as much in the bank as you think, he confessed. Bert had to be buried, you know, and I coughed up what the others couldn't raise. How much was it? Forty dollars. I was going to stand off the butcher and the rest for a while. They knew I was good pay, but they put it to me straight. They'd been carrying the shopmen right along and was up against it themselves. And now, with that strike smashed, they're pretty much smashed themselves. So I took it all out of the bank. I knew you wouldn't mind. You don't, do you? She smiled bravely and bravely overcame the sinking feeling at her heart. It was the only right thing to do, Billy. I would have done it if you were lying sick, and Bert would have done it for you and me if it had been the other way round. His face was glowing. Gee, Saxon, 
A fellow can always count on you. You're like my right hand. That's why I say no more babies. If I lose you, I'm crippled for life. We've got to economize, she mused, nodding her appreciation. How much is in the bank? Just about thirty dollars, you see. I had to pay Martha Skelton and for the a few other little things, and the union took time by the neck and levied a four-dollar emergency assessment on every member just to be ready if the strike was pulled off. But Doc Hentley can wait. He said as much. He's the goods, if anybody should ask you. How'd you like him? I liked him, but I don't know about doctors. He's the first I ever had, except when I was vaccinated once, and then the city did that. Looks like the streetcar men are going out, too. Dan Fallon's come to town. Came all the way from New York. Tried to sneak in on the quiet, but the fellows knew when he left New York and kept track of him all the way across. They have to. He's Johnny on the spot whenever streetcar men are licked into shape. He's won lots of streetcar strikes for the bosses. Keeps an army of strike breakers and ships them all over the country on special trains wherever they're needed. Oakland's never seen labor troubles like she's got and is going to get. All hell's going to break loose from the looks of it. Watch out for yourself, then, Billy. I don't want to lose you, either. Oh, that's all right. I can take care of myself, and besides, it ain't as though we was licked. We've got a good chance. But you'll lose if there's any killing. Yep, we got to keep an eye out against that. No violence? No gunfighting or dynamite, he assented. But a heap of scabs will get their heads broke. That has to be. But you won't do any of that, Billy. Not so any slob can testify before a court to having seen me. Then, with a quick shift, he changed the subject. Old Barry Higgins is dead. I didn't want to tell you till you was out of bed. Buried him a week ago. And the old woman's moving to Frisco. She told me she'd be in to say goodbye. She stuck by you pretty well them first couple of days and she showed Martha Shelton a few that made her hair curl. She got Martha's goat from the jump. End of section 25